Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecchiolozano. Today, we welcome Dr. Donald Wallenfein back on the podcast, where he's going to explore with us what is phenomenology and how do we see it lived out both in the child and in our atria. I hope you enjoy. Donnie, welcome back to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thanks so much, Carrie. A great gift as always to be a part of this wonderful ministry. It's a great gift to have you with us. Would you like to tell us, um, for anybody who didn't listen to that first episode with you, a little bit about who is Donnie Wallenfang? For sure. Yeah, so I'm Donnie Wallenfang, and born in Kalamazoo, Michigan, raised in Benton Harbor in St. Joseph, Michigan, and I'm married to Megan, who's a Uper, raised in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and uh, we met at Albion College back in the year 1997, and Megan's a CGS formation leader. We have six children, ages 22 down to eight. One daughter, five sons. Our daughter, Ellen, is the oldest. And uh, I've been involved with CGS for the past 23 years. What a gift it's been as a catechist in levels one, two, and three. But I would consider myself especially a level three catechist with the level three child. And I received my doctorate in theology from Loyola University Chicago in 2011. And I'm currently a professor of theology and philosophy at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. And finally, my wife, Megan, and I are both third order Carmelites and love contemplative prayer, love contemplating the child and this intersection of contemplative prayer and catechesis of the Good Shepherd. That's awesome. Do you uh, find yourself in the level three atrium because you feel like your skill set specifically fits the level three child? Or do you feel like you identify more with the level three child yourself? Like, I feel like I am a level one child, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is why I find myself there all the time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's... um... It's so interesting because I've had experience in in all three levels, I guess, through um, trial and error uh, and much humiliation. (laughs) Um, I guess I'm still I'm still trying to discover how best to serve the level one child, Mm. Um, because when I'm in a level one atrium, I'm just contemplating what's going on so much. and, And sometimes they make moves and do things I don't know how to respond to best. I'm always asking Megan after the fact. She's she's so much more a level one catechist. But yeah, I think my um, my mind identifies with the level three child and um, thinking about the Jewish roots of the faith and, and getting into all of the very powerful uh, proclamation elements of the faith um, and the plan of God and uh, and all the historical pieces. I just love that investigation. Uh, this past Sunday, I was working with children in level three atrium and beginning with one girl's observation of the ruins of Herod's temple in one of the books in the atrium. We then went to uh, geography and scripture and the plan of God and, and all these things are connecting so fast and and I just love to be uh, accompanying uh, the children in their discovery of uh, this great constellation of meaning within the faith. Mm. Yeah, the level three child definitely has bigger and deeper questions. That is for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's beautiful to see that those those connections that they make the synthesis that they make it's 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 really neat yes i love the synthesis this uh, christian theology all about synthesis and gathering up all the fragments of meaning uniting them into this organic whole of salvation history and intimate relationship with god Mm -hmm. yeah 
So Donnie, today um, you're going to dive into a topic that honestly I didn't even know existed until I met you. (laughs) (laughs) And it took me a while to even figure out how to say this. So we're going to talk about phenomenology. And I have to tell you the story when Mary Marioni and I were talking about this topic um, and I was trying to get her to help me be able to pronounce it correctly (laughs) this is how she that it's this is how she helped me and now it's stuck in my head she was like it's phenomenology do 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 phenomenology (laughs) (laughs) like the muppets (laughs) yes and so now every time i think about phenomenology i go do 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 <laughs> it's a challenging word to, to say. Yeah, the word itself is intimidating until one has practiced saying phenomenology. And even with practice, sometimes we, we stumble on the word because it has so many syllables. Yeah, yeah. So break it down for us. What is phenomenology? Yeah, this is something I've been waiting to um, get to share about for so many years this intersection between a philosophical method developed at the turn of the 20th century and catechesis of the Good Shepherd, how these things go together so well. Sophia Cavaletti was fond of saying, all is gift. And phenomenology is the philosophical method I would put forward as best positioned to grant us access to the mystery of gift and all its fruitful givenness. So phenomenology uh, was a method pioneered by 20th century German philosopher named Edmund Husserl, H-U-S-S-E-R-L, and it attends to the experience, lived human experience, while driven by the exigencies we have for truth, love, and ethical responsibility for the other. It recognizes the primary perception within lived experience, the primacy of this perception, and focuses on what Husserl calls the things themselves, and that is what phenomena are, everything that gives itself within conscious lived experience, everything we experience uh, in our in our perception, color, shape, but feeling, but especially meaning meaning and signification. So phenomenology gathers up all the data, the givens of lived experience that give themselves to the interpreting human subject to high degrees of saturation. And what gives itself primarily in our lived experiences is meaning. Phenomenology, therefore, is the science of meaning. It's a purely descriptive method So different than metaphysics, which is an explanatory method, asking what is this or that. Instead, phenomenology asks simply what gives and how it gives itself and then seeks to describe what has given itself within experience. So phenomenology is this method that can deal with those saturating experiences we have every day that defy static categories and definitions. And this is why phenomenology is such an important method to use when investigating religious experiences, and especially those of the child. Can you give us some examples to help us understand more about what this is? For sure. Um, First, I would give a quote from Pope John Paul II that he said in a 2003 address. He said that phenomenology is primarily a style of thought, a relationship of the mind with reality, whose essential and constitutive features it aims to grasp, avoiding prejudice and schematisms. I mean that it is, as it were, an attitude of intellectual charity to the human being and the world, and for the believer to God, the beginning and end of all things. So phenomenology, it's primarily this attitude of openness to everything that gives itself an experience. And I would suggest that it has three basic steps uh, that could be signified by three simple words. Number one, bracket. Number two, receive. Number three, 
describe. So then we ask, what's being bracketed in step one? This is what Edmund Husserl calls the natural attitude needs to be bracketed. What the natural attitude is, it's an attitude that's taken uh, shape over time and it's hardened over time within uh, the older person, the adult person. We have many experiences in life that leave us jaded, disappointed, uh, not able to trust people, uh, and and we can be left rather skeptical, cynical, um, things like this. So to bracket the natural attitude is to deliberately, intentionally hold in suspense and set aside all unwarranted prejudices, presuppositions, biases, and working assumptions that we would bring to a new experience. To intentionally bracket all these kind of things and set them aside as best we can. And it's especially God's grace that will make this happen, uh, that we receive through the sacraments in the church and the reading of scripture and a fervent life of prayer. But the intentionality within our minds to have this attitude adjustment, this attitude change right at the beginning is so important. And we think of this as catechists before we enter the atrium, that we need to do this deliberate procedure in addition to prayer, but really become even more self-aware, again, of all of those various biases, assumptions, even about the children we're serving in the atrium. We have to bracket and set aside what happened last week if something went wrong and say, what's, what's the new thing that can happen today? How does God want to speak to us in the atrium today? So bracketing the natural attitude is the first key step and probably the most difficult. And it coincides with the Christian concept of conversion, the conversion of heart we read about in scripture. When Jesus says, repent and believe in the gospel, that, that Greek word we translate as repent is metanoia, which means a change of heart and mind, a complete renovation and renewal and restoration to seeing how God sees, hearing how God hears, noticing how God notices. So once the natural attitude is bracketed, we move to the second step of the method, which is to receive all that gives itself within lived experience. And it's the phenomena themselves are what give themselves to us in our conscious perception they give themselves by themselves. So for example, when we enter the atrium, we're enveloped by an environment with all of these, these beautiful, interesting, inviting materials. And to receive all they have to give, we slow down our perception. We take in one thing at a time, focusing on this and then that. And this makes all the difference. Instead of just glossing over it all with with a kind of uh, could be suspicious or um, self uh, convinced that there's nothing new under the sun kind of attitude, like we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, Kohaleth, saying vanity, vanity, everything is vanity, chasing after wind. There's nothing new under the sun. We have to bracket all that and re then receive everything that gives itself. And lastly. Then once we receive, we respond. This is what the children do in the atrium after receiving a presentation of a material, working with the material themselves. Then they have this desire to respond to it with a song or a prayer or drawing a picture or having a procession uh, or doing hole punching or something inspires them to respond. And this is the third step of the method, why I think it coincides so well with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, that then we describe and interpret all that has given itself within the lived experience through all modes of expression possible, including words and art. So this description in the wake of experience involves interpretation and the use of signs. Okay, so let me see if I'm understanding correctly. So the three steps that you were just lifting up of bracketing, receiving, and responding, this is a way of living into the method of phenomenology? 
Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then the three steps of bracketing, am I correct in saying that it's like, kind of like what Jean Agobi and listening to God with children talked about with an examination of conscience. It's like becoming aware of your state, um, of your natural prejudices, whatever is going on inside of you ahead of time or at this moment, exactly. right? And, and yeah, bracketing them right. so that you can mm -hmm. um, truly move to the second step, which is to fully be in the moment, fully receive the gift that is right in front of you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Right. And then the third one is the responding to the gift. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a very intentional methodology. And the payoff is that it allows us to receive the gift as fully as possible. Right. Uh, and again, it coincides hand in hand with Jana talks about that examination of conscience, that Christian uh, conversion, that 180 degree turn in a new direction, following Christ, following child, following the mysteries of faith. As a French phenomenologist, see, I was <laughs> stumbling over the word myself, which is okay. <laughs> and it's, it's like a new... Point of humor, great. We'll take it. Uh, <laughs> so there's a 20th century French phenomenologist, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who explored the newly forming frontiers of child psychology. And he said that the whole effort of phenomenology is to recover this naive contact with the world and to give it at last a philosophical status. So it's taking seriously the givenness of the child, the child's perception, the child's discoveries, the child's marvelous way of development over the course of time. And this mystically naive contact with the world is exemplified in the child. And this is why we can consider the child himself or herself to be a phenomenologist extraordinaire. Yeah, I'm hearing you. As you were just describing that, I was thinking, so basically to become a phenomenologist, we need to become like the child. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Because the child shows to us the Marian fiat. Again, this the way the Blessed Virgin Mary is open to the will of God and the word of God, so much so that it is conceived in the flesh within the core of her being. <laughs> this, this event of the Annunciation, which is one of our materials in the atrium, where... The word comes to her through the angel Gabriel and says, You're, you've been chosen to be the mother of the Savior. And the Latin response, Ece Ancilla Domini, Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, let it be done unto me according to her, this letting it be done, this, this, let, this fiat. We also have this in the Our Father, Fiat voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra. Thy will be done. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the key to salvation on the end of the creature, to say yes to the gift of God. So to have a method to help calibrate our perception to the highest degree of passivity possible so that the gift and givenness can be received to the maximum measure is huge. And we discover children to be the kings and queens of radical passivity before the gift that gives itself to the point of abandonment. Mm -hmm. Above all, our Eucharistic Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for his sheep and calls them by name. Yeah, they just so naturally do that. That is in their nature to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so for us as the adult, it is our responsibility to help create an environment both within ourselves in the physical environment that it allows for them to be in that state that they so naturally can fall into. And then I would also say to follow them into it as well. Right. Right. To let them guide us. Yeah. If it's true that as Sophia says in RPC one, chapter one, uh, the metaphysical child, she's talking about the child is rich in love. If this is true, how good it is to follow this expert in loving <laughs> and how he or she loves. Nothing inhibits the child's pure and free reception of all that gives within his or her lived experience. The child has much to teach us because 
She bears an authentic exigence of life, as Sophia talks about it. So yeah, how we prepare that environment of encounter for the child to serve the child is our greatest responsibility as a catechist to allow the child to ask what gives. Hmm. I feel like that's such a huge responsibility, but also, also a natural one, like also one that already exists. We just have to allow it to exist, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's making room for love to transpire. Maria Montessori in her book, The Absorbent Mind, the very last chapter entitled Love and Its Source, is so um, fitting here to think about just a few of these uh, short passages uh, where she writes, Love and the hope of it are not things one can learn. They are a part of life's heritage. It is life that really speaks, not just the poets and the prophets. As Montessori talks about this education to life and why we have the practical uh, works, practical life works in the atrium to foster uh, this naturally unfolding lived experience for the child within the atrium. Because as Montessori says, the mind of the child, which receives all, does not judge, does not refuse, does not react. It absorbs everything and incarnates it in the coming man as the child continues to grow and develop. The child perfectly brackets the natural attitude because she does not have one. And this is why the child is so instructive for the adult, how she's able to receive everything with such innocent purity, not judging in advance, not canceling out possibility, but promoting it and this privileging of possibility. The absorbent mind of the child welcomes everything, Montessori says, puts its hope in everything, accepts poverty equally with wealth, adopts any religion and the prejudices and habits of its countrymen, incarnating all in itself. This is the child. The child receives all that gives itself in her lived experience through a powerfully porous perception. Like a sponge, the child absorbs all that gives itself within her local environment. And so for the adult to study this love exemplified in the child will lead us, Montessori says, to the source from which it springs back Mm -hmm. to the child. And I think especially the Christ child, because the child is rich in love. She perpetually teaches us adults how to love by letting love be loved within us. Mm. I feel like we're going to have to sit with and listen to that a few more times to absorb how (laughs) much goodness is within what you just read. And I feel like it also just highlights this, what you're talking about today, but also last time with the metaphysical child. I feel like it just highlights again for us what this work has taught us that the child, like it's like the theology of the child, like they have so much to show us without words most of the time about how we can grow closer to God, but also about who God is. Like, it's just so amazing how innate it is in them to embody this. It's just, it's beautiful to really think about how, profound the child is just in their own right and their innate self it's it's pretty mind-boggling honestly yeah yeah and i think ann garrido gives us a helpful tip too uh from her book entitled redeeming conflict where she talks about empathic or pentecost listening this is something we adults can really try to do better as we approach the child at home in the atrium anywhere But this listening for meaning, again, that bracketing of the natural attitude, opening up uh, the receptors of perception to all that would give itself in experience, 
and and Anne writes that just like the miracle of Pentecost, in which people from all over the Mediterranean world were able to hear the good news of Jesus, proclaimed in their own languages, this Pentecost listening allows one to hear the same good news proclaimed by the lips of infants and babes, where we find that perfect praise to still the enemy and avenger, to quote from Psalm 8, verse 3. So according to, to Anne Garrido, through this Pentecost listening, she says, we keep open that space for the spirit to enter and for a miracle of the ears to occur. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very powerful. Very humble. Mm. Donnie, as a father of six and having studied both catechesis of the Good Shepherd and different levels of theology for many decades now, how do you feel like it has affected the way that you interact with your own children? <laughs> yeah, it's been so amazing to be a father. I'm still reeling <laughs> <laughs> of, of the gift of, of this fatherhood. Uh, my own children have taught me so much over the years and trying to continue to gather up everything that they've been teaching me at their different ages. And, and now I'm moving, you know, into middle age and older children. And, and what's this like, you know, life uh, for them uh, beyond the atrium, beyond being a child in the atrium. Right. And um, something I think I've come to discover in my theological studies, and um, I write about uh, at length in, in a book I published some years ago called Dialectical Anatomy of the Eucharist, that there's these two worlds happening within human development. One we could call this theology of childhood, which you mentioned earlier, and the other, the theology of adulthood. Mm -hmm. uh, and Megan and I also talk about this in our, our book on Carmelite spirituality called Shoeless. Um, and in using the German terms Kinder Theologie and um, for the, this theology of childhood, the, uh, this, this garden for the child, this kindergarten, uh, we could think about the atrium in this way and, and a good home life in this way, the domestic church. But to let the theology of childhood prevail that so often gets overlooked and neglected, while at the same time allowing this maturation to take place into uh, adulthood, characterized by uh, the Jewish um, bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah to be a son or daughter of the law. That happens as we move up into that level three atrium. We really see things moving in this complementarity of that theology of childhood that's especially evident in, in level one and even more in the infant and toddler atrium. Mm -hmm. And then, but as the child matures, they're, they are going into something new, these new planes of development uh, into um, this, this theology of adulthood that will involve more speaking, more text, more interpretation. And uh, so the complementarity between both of these things you know, both lived out to their highest pitch, both childhood and adulthood, and that we don't leave the theology of childhood behind as we get older, but we continue to grow into it, all the while re realizing we are developing into something new, this theology of uh, adulthood. And we can think about it with the phenomenological terms, manifestation for that theology of childhood, where there's less words, we're really counting our words, and it's letting um, the manifestation of the material themselves uh, communicate the mystery. But then it's a theology of adulthood. It's about proclamation. It's about word, speech, text, witness, testimony. And here's where Cavaletti draws very much from another 20th century French phenomenologist named Paul Ricoeur. We see his name show up in her writings all over the place. And even uh, Anne Garrido in her book, A Year with Sophia Cavaletti, has a whole uh, chapter on Ricoeur. And Ricoeur was a phenomenologist uh, who, who focused on biblical interpretation as well as religious experience. 
Bercor is quoted multiple times in Cavaletti's essay, My Readings, and other journal articles. And Bercor helps us understand how the mind processes the story of history moving from the global to the particular. And this becomes the work of that theology of adulthood, especially the level three child and beyond. Uh, we practitioners of CGS wonder what to do in youth ministry, what mm -hmm. to do for high school age children, teenagers, young adults, what's supposed to be happening there in terms of their ongoing evangelization and catechesis. And I think Ricoeur gives us a lot of clues into this and the power of the parables of Jesus as signs of the kingdom of God. And the term he uses, and, and Cavaletti quotes, intersignification in reference to the need to synthesize, as we were talking about earlier, the teaching of the parables, and how all the signs within a parable uh, light up and relate to one another and generate meaning within their interplay. How all the signs within a parable form a constellation of meaning that ushers us into the reality of the kingdom of God that is at once, Jesus says, within us, and yet he says his kingdom is not here. This paradox, the already and the not yet within Christian theology. And so this phenomenological approach to the biblical text and the manifestation of the materials in the atrium allow us to receive the unending deluge of meaning that is woven by the delicate hands of God. So, for example, in the Pearl of Great Price, it's only one verse, Matthew chapter 13, verse 46. But so much is packed mm -hmm. into these two sentences, this one verse of Scripture, and Jesus giving us this parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. And we could just slow down that process of interpretation and go word by word and, and just squeeze each word like a sponge and let that meaning pour out of it. That's this, this combination, this what I call dialectic between the child and the adult both having something to share with the other through the course of human development. And every interpretation is a new event of meaning. Meaning is made through this art of interpretation. We think of the rabbinic midrash, this process of interpreting the sacred text uh, through all of these various layers, the different senses of the biblical text, both literal and spiritual in the spiritual senses, including allegorical, you know, metaphorical, tropological or moral, anagogical or things relating to the life to come, that transcendent kingdom of God. So I wanted to be sure uh, I touched on Cavaletti's uptake of Paul Ricoeur. And I think what I've noticed in the atrium is this rapprochement, this coming together and complementarity of the theology of childhood in a theology of adulthood that develops into that level three atrium mm -hmm. and beyond. So as a, as a father, this comes from my observations of my own children. And before academia, I was serving in youth and young adult ministry. And so I was working primarily with teenagers and young adults and um, thinking about how all the various planes of development unfold within a person's life and how uh, the, the catechist, the servant leader within the church can accompany, as Pope Francis talks about, the art of accompaniment for the person, how we can pastorally accompany every person on their way uh, to entering fully this kingdom of God and union with God. Hmm. Yeah, I like what you were talking about with the theology of the childhood, but also the theology of adulthood. At first, I was thinking about it kind of like a butterfly, you know, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But I don't know if that's a great description, because in some ways, I think even when as we move into the part where we're in theology of adulthood, even like a level three child or after level three, I think we still embody some of that theology of the child, which is why they have so much to show us. So it's almost like we are we are one and 
we are both in some way as we develop, we might become more dominant, I think, in the adulthood part. But Mm -hmm. um, that inner child is still there that can lead us back to the heart of everything. Like, I think Mm -hmm. just like what you see in the level three atrium, these these kids are able, like you said at the very beginning, able to make these bigger questions, these deeper questions and layers of things and synthesize things. And But as you kind of pull everything into, synthesize it in together, it almost fits back into the essential point that we only proclaimed, that was all that we proclaimed in level one. Have right. you seen? So there's still that inner child there within the as we've moved into the adulthood part of our spirituality, there's still that inner child theologian as well. That's still sitting with the essential that's still sitting with the gift and response. So I don't know if we're caterpillars turning into butterflies. I think, think we kind of become both. Yeah. Yeah. It's a paradox uh, in both directions. Yeah. In a sense, to use that analogy, the butterfly that's there in the beginning uh, and, and again, the um, the the entelechy within the child, the the maturity is already ripe in childhood, in yeah. a real way. Yeah. And and maybe we we drift off into a, a caterpillar state for a while, <laughs> and then have to be resurrected, the metamorphosis into butterfly, into adulthood. And as a uh, um, German twentieth uh, century theologian Karl Rahner talks about. Um, that as we mature as adults, we at the same time have to continue to live into childhood. Right. To continue right. to mature into childhood. You know, but at the same time, we have this paradox of like St. Paul saying, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, acted like a child, but then I became a man and set aside ch- these ways of the childhood. Um, but then we have Jesus saying, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to become like a child. And so it's like, make up your mind, New Testament. Which <laughs> <way is> it? <laughs> but it's both, uh, like you're saying, it's it's this um, both and uh, uh, to rise to the heights of contemplation with both wings uh, in the end. And, mm. and it's how the logic of Christianity gives itself to us, where the last will be first, where the servant is the master and to save our lives we must lose them all yeah. these kind of things that jesus teaches uh so um it's a um, a double development growing in in both directions yeah uh, for the complete person to take shape yeah yeah i agree there's a lot to unpack there i think sometimes we think we need to let go of the childhood part in order to become like a fully mature christian adult but I think what all of this is teaching us, what you've been lifting up today is, you no, know, that's not, it's the, it's the both and like what you were just mm-hmm. saying, we need both mm-hmm. aspects of, of our humanity to right. um, truly live into being Christ-like. Yeah. There's a lot there that, that there's a lot to unpack in everything you've been lifting up today. Mm. Thanks so, so much. beautiful. Is there anything, Donnie, else that you would like to lift up before we finish? Yeah, maybe just two points. Um, Just to piggyback on what you were saying there, we think of the liturgical year as um, allowing us to continue to enter into that both and celebrating, you know, Advent and the Christmas mysteries that celebrates, you know, even within Advent, we have these readings in the cycle of readings about the coming of Christ, about the end. Right. But we're really preparing to celebrate the beginning. Right. And, and it's but there's such a unity between the two, these these bookends of the plan of God from creation to parousia and the redemption, the bridge between. And so the liturgical cycle, the liturgical year allows us to enter into both the infancy of Christ. Uh, all the way back to, we have this other paradox right in the heart of Lent as we're preparing to celebrate the Paschal mystery and the end of Jesus' life and his death and resurrection. We have um, on March 25th, uh, the Feast of the Annunciation mm-hmm. about his his virginal conception. And, and again, all these things nestled together like Russian Matryoshka dolls, <laughs> one thing nested within the other. Uh, and and so it's, it's so much a uh, pregnancy of meaning within the liturgical life 
of the church. And lastly, this allows us uh, to become uh, what Montessori talked about, the new adult and uh, the new adult that the new child needs. And we're definitely called to ongoing conversion day and night that God's grace can draw us to a deeper level than we were yesterday. Uh, and, and that we are on our way. We're en route to living into the kingdom of God fully in the life to come in the communion of angels and saints. And as St. Paul talks about in his letter to the Romans, God wants to give us this newness of life. As Jesus says in the gospel, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And so the child instructs us adults how to live into that newness of life that is so ripe within their little paradoxical, phenomenological hmm. worlds of meaning and being. Hmm. That they so naturally live into. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Donnie. Thank you for just skimming the surface of this really deep and beautiful topic for us and helping us see the connections between um, this mode of theology and what the child and CGS so naturally have fallen into. My pleasure, Carrie. It's such a privilege for me to be a part of this ongoing conversation uh, within the CGS community and uh, especially this facet of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. So thanks so much for inviting me into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd in the Child podcast. In our show notes, you will find links to all the different books that Donnie referred to throughout our conversation, including a few of his own on phenomenology, if you would like to know more about it. I also put a link in there for the episode that we did on the metaphysical child with Donnie, as well as the episode I did with his wife, Megan, on merciful parenting. Don't forget that you can submit a listener question. If you have a question about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, check out the show notes in order to do that. We now have the third edition of The Religious Potential of the Child by Sophia Cavaletti on audiobook available through Audible. We have more information in our show notes about that as well. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all of our contributing members because you are making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.